At the end of the 70s, the Sudanese government started to work on one of the most grandiose schemes that has ever been undertaken in Africa, the digging of the Jongle Canal. It was hoped that this would prevent 70 million cubic meters of water a day evaporating and bring North and South Sudan closer together. But civil war broke out. A rebellion among Nilotic black tribes brought operations to a halt when the machine was destroyed. True to say, the Nile is not an Arabian river. These cataracts, like the swamp itself, have long since impeded the breakthrough to the south and Muslim colonization. All the more so, as the British only discovered the sources of the Nile in the 19th century. In the heart of the Sudan, in the province of Kordofan, cave etchings bear witness to the oldest settlements of the southern tribes. Populations such as the Nubas were able to escape from the Arab slave dealers by seeking refuge among these granite rocks. In times gone by, the Nuba perched their villages on the heights in the most inaccessible of places. This mistrust, this fear of strangers has never left them, and neither has that of baneful influences or possession of spirits a fear which is daily made manifest in the enduring continuance of minor exorcist motions, making use of the musical whip. The paintings are designed to protect the huts. The men's house among the Nuba stands out distinctly on account of its bright contrasting colors. It's a way of marking out one's territory. The women's house is composed of several small round buildings with an inner courtyard. To each building is allocated a precise function in the life of the household. There's a single entrance, keyhole shaped. Inside, we have a bedroom the kitchen, the millet and sorghum granary, the tool shed. The Nuba, first and foremost, are farmers. The only opening in the grain silo is a bullseye window high up the wall and generally plugged up. Opposite it, the kitchen and its set of calabashes. The more wives Anuba has, the richer and more respected he is. Often his wives are a docile supply of cheap labor, particularly for work in the fields. And then, like elsewhere in Africa, investing in a large family now brings its reward tomorrow. Yet one child out of two will fail to reach the age of seven. <laughs> the Nubas represent a wide variety of populations, 99 tribes, speaking over 50 different dialects. Islam has begun to encroach on certain villages, but old customs die hard. If, for example, Allah were to prohibit eating pork, it would be given another name, because pork is delicious. The Nuba used to live free. They used to live naked, far from police checks. Recently, the Muslim governor of the province, a new style fundamentalist, has made it compulsory to wear shorts. International cooperation has brought thousands of gaudy colored clothes to the Sudan, which have difficulty matching up to the superb body paints of former times. Prison terms are now inflicted upon any Nuba man or woman daring to come out undressed. During the dry season, work in the fields drop off. The men just love that period, a reminder to us of our holiday time. Out on the plains, they keep an eye on their young cattle.
This is the time when people get down to little jobs, community life, and one can indulge in music making and games. It's a carefree life of tranquility with no timetable to abide by, no productive goals to be met, a haven from stress, but a far cry from all the measures that give us our feelings of security. All Nubas take pleasure in wrestling, which they learn from the cradle. Here we have daily training at the winter camp. Novices are taught poses to intimidate. Parries. Subtle hold. The stuff of true wrestlers, which, for the Nuba, has great value. <laughs> Fierce wrestling contests are held between villages during this dry season period. Groups from the various hillsides come to challenge or be challenged to gain ascendancy. The wrestlers' bodies are often sprinkled with ash, the significance of which is quasi-religious. Many also carry buffalo hide shields, boughs of acacia, which will be the victor's reward. Last year's champions wear a calabash behind them, like a tail, making it more difficult to fight this year by hampering their movements, a handicap as it were. Nuba wrestling is much more than entertainment. It is magical in nature. Nuba wrestling involves moral and physical assets, values, and a chance for the individual and his clan to survive. For only victorious wrestlers, will be reborn in the next life. Virility is measured in terms of physical strength, of course, but skill, intelligence, and beauty of the body also have their importance, despite the international aid shorts. The wrestling matches are arranged according to age group. Contrary to appearance, rules are fairly strict, and the referees often interfere. The purpose is not at all to wound one's adversary, but simply to bowl him over, so that his shoulders touch the ground. The victor's symbolic reward, the acacia branch, will be burnt at night. The ashes will be gathered up, sealed in a bull's horn that the wrestler will keep until the end of his life. This is important, for one day the body will disappear, but in the bull's horn buried in another grave, his soul will live on in the ashes. Everyone must win at least one fight in his life, otherwise he will be deprived of reincarnation.
The beauty of the body is exalted by women too, of course, even when they go about their lowly household chores or are on their way to the well. Something in their deportment, in their carriage, bespeaks this. And as always, the ornaments, the jewels, seldom sumptuous, but sometimes unexpected. During her lifetime, a woman undergoes three scarification processes, representing three major stages in her existence. Childhood at seven, nubility, and her third pregnancy. Mankind's eternal conceit, the never-ending search to adorn the body. But here the necklaces are beads embedded in the skin. Scarification after scarification, true ornaments of the flesh. There's a concern for aesthetic appeal, too, in the curves of the mud architecture. In the decorating of the most mundane objects. Why decorate a calabash? Why is this concern so universal? It has been said that a very, very long time ago, decoration was a precursor to writing. care for beauty also in the motions of day-to-day -day life. Running water. But it is at the full moon, with the whole sky lit up, that in the land of the Nuba, as in many other regions of Africa, the most prestigious gatherings take place. In certain villages, people throng in from all around. Each community, sometimes with its own distinct language and customs, comes to show off its banners, its flags. Today, a great trial by ordeal is to be held, a Dawas. Plaintiffs and defendants are all decked out, dressed up, powdered, feathered, conditioned, spurred on by the rhythms of the throbbing music until nearly in a trance. are going to have to fight it out in front of the law courts. Millet flour, the purpose of which is to deaden the blows a bit, is sprinkled on shoulders and the nape of the neck. Their seconds arm the contestants with wooden arm bucklers, shin guards, and fighting staves. Then they advance into the arena. Several fights take place at the same time in the very heart of this Labu village. All the fights are refereed by judges, designated after long confabulations, before being accepted by everyone.
contender's aim is to strike his opponent's head and shoulders, violently so if possible, even if it should mean knocking him out or killing him. Dawas is a trial by battle. Like in Europe in the Middle Ages, in the course of certain legal proceedings, when the courts were engaged in trials by combat, acquittals or condemnations depended on the verdict of arms. And so it's here. When the customary assembly of tribal chiefs produces no results, the parties at dispute are ordered to fight it out with staves. Thus the Luba Nuba settle accusations of adultery, witchcraft or cattle rustling. Serious issues. And God is the sole judge. The blows to the shin guards or arm bucklers generally prove harmless. But blows to the head can inflict serious damage. Some parties, if they are brave enough, despite the risks involved, reluctantly decide to fend for themselves. Many, however, prefer to hire the services of mercenaries, true stave-fight professionals, renowned as such throughout the region. Every society needs its idols, and you take the idols you can get. Still in the Kordofan and the Atbara bushland, the great nomadic Bagara, Kababish, or Rashaida groups still move to and from pasture. A remarkable phenomenon in these overheated parts, the baldachinos, protective canopies. These protect the women from the sun. These nomads coming from Arabia some centuries ago with their language and under the conquering banner of Islam have mingled with the African animist world, one of the innumerable facets of Islam on the move. Babish are nomads of their own free will. They only go to the Nile in the event of severe drought, and this has occurred frequently in recent years. halting place, the women tend their children, look after the goats, fetch water, churn the butter, weave cloth, slowly but surely, and make broth of sorghum and curdled milk. <laughs> women also put up tents, dwellings made of goat hair. After the naked peoples of the Upper Nile area, the Mercy, the Dinka, and the Nuba, here then come men wearing dresses, and women wrapped in swaths of veils. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
It is often said that a Bedouin woman wears her fortune at all times, her silver, her bronze, or gold jewelry, very often also a heavy mask. What matters to her is to see without being seen. In opposition with the other nomads of the Sudan, the Rashaida, who only emigrated from Arabia in the 19th century, have never mingled with the Sudanese tribes. Like the Bedouins of Saudi Arabia, they deem themselves to be the only true Arabs, the seed of the purest of noblest races. The immutable coffee ritual, just as it is in the tents of Arabia, a few drops in tiny cups. But the coffee is still served three times in accordance with a true ceremonial. Since the conquest of Egypt by the Arabs in the 7th century, Islam has never stopped spreading through Africa. The Sudan, formerly divided into Coptic Christian realms, experienced an era of power. But when the Christian kings allowed Arab caravans to travel freely, tradespeople and pilgrims to settle, mosques to be erected, the process of Islamization went beyond the point of no return. Today, the whole of Sudanese Nubia is Muslim and Arabicized. What extraordinary adaptability to arid climes. The Bedouin owes his survival to sheep, goats, and camels, and they in turn owe their existence to the thorny acacia, which is to be found everywhere. And the Arabian caravans continue ever onward towards the frontiers of Kenya and Ethiopia. Ethiopia, from where the Nile's greatest affluent breaks forth and one of Africa's most majestic rivers, the Blue Nile. It peacefully drifts out of Lake Tana at an altitude of 6,000 feet, only to hurtle down dizzy falls which the Ethiopians call smoke without fire. Central Ethiopia, the Ethiopia of the Blue Nile, is the high country. Only mules can climb the steep sides of these mountains. Its thriftiness and stamina have made it a multi-purpose means of transport and locomotion. We are in the clouds, at an altitude of 11,500 feet. In summer in the years of abundance when it rains, for four months, hail, downpours, and mist are the daily lots of these heights, plunged in the coldest of melancholias bogs, swamps, sodden tracks. The years of the fat kin for Ethiopia when the rain does come is a fertile land. With his antiquated plow like those in Egyptian frescoes, a farmer scratches the topsoil. A twisted yoke and beam culminating in a short iron point, a technique dating back to the dawn of countryside civilizations, nonetheless making for two or three harvests of millet a year. When the corn is ripe, it is cut with a sickle and then threshed as in Sumerian times by trampling on it. Threshing with clubs too, more effective for teff grass, a sort of small grained millet. Finally winnowing, grain and husk separated by the wind. With teff meal, the women prepare injera flat cakes, as large as a cartwheel. A pancake with an acid flavor seasoned with pimento, the local staple food. The market attracts thousands of villagers every week, sometimes hailing from afar, their wares loaded on donkeys or perched on the women's heads. In the Saleh market, there are 3,000 people there every Monday. It's a traditional Amhara center. 
in the Begemda province, which has been through years of drought and forced resettlements. The Amharas, convinced of their superiority, their prestigious origin, with a hint of Semitic traits, and proud of their Christian faith. As early as the fourth century, monks exiled from Syria sowed the seeds of Orthodox Christianity in these African mountains. Few countries can boast so many churches, hermitages, and monasteries. Sometimes these monasteries are perched atop Anbas flat-top peaks, which are easier for birds to get to than man. At Debra Damu, monks and faithful alike reach their church on top of the plateau by climbing up a 50-foot cliff using a rope. The most astounding churches in the country were carved out of rock in Lalibela in the 13th century. Chiseled windows, doors, vaults, pillars, most with different motifs. Hollowed out of the ground, St. George's Church in the form of a cross. Lalibela, a holy city with its buildings separated by ditches and linked up by underground galleries. A center of meditation where dozens of generations of hermits and monks have followed in each other's footsteps. In the region of Aksum, there lives one of the last painters of Byzantine inspiration, Johannes, a 75-year-old monk whose depiction of Christ and the Old Testament figures adorn a fair number of sanctuaries. In Ge'ez characters, Ge'ez is the liturgical language of Ethiopia, the name of a saint is mentioned, Tekla Heymanath. As with the Byzantine painters, this icon is not signed. The most remarkable aspect to the Ethiopian rite is its sumptuousness, a truly oriental splendor which literally bursts forth on religious feast days. The church tablet, the sacred symbol of the Ark of the Covenant, born in procession under multicolored parasols. Deacons, priests, sacristans, bedecked in silk finery, holding their procession crosses, march forward to the applause of the crowd. Out of the underground galleries, the banners, the oriflames surge forward. On Palm Sunday, or at the Nativity, the local dignitaries with their brocade garb encircle the bishop in black garments. The clergy then show off their finest chiseled crowns. The faithful press forward towards the crucifixes, while on the walls of Great St. Mary's Church, 200 deacons prepare to dance to the rhythms of the masenkos, sistrums, and the chanting of the cantors. This is a ceremony of biblical origins to reenact the dance of King David before the sacred ark. Thank you. 
Nubia, linking the Sudan to Egypt, is a huge oasis, a luxuriant though narrow fringe of vegetation all the way along the Nile. In these calm waters, we spent whole days drifting along beside the riverbanks, only to discover a gentle and open-hearted people with a warm welcome, even though these men of Upper Nubia have always led a very harsh existence. Wherever the Nile flows, there vegetation grows. Livestock prospers, but the desert is only a stone's throw away. Basically, agriculture has always been concentrated on alluvial soil, which, although rich, has long since been overpopulated, requiring both man and beast to be at it all the time. The Noria, invented millennia ago, with its ingenious twin cogwheel system driven by animals, makes it possible to bring up water from a few feet down, making the peasant farmer relatively independent of the water level in the river. Water wheels were already known in the time of the pharaohs, at least under the new empire, 3,000 years old and still going. Along this part of the Nile, the vernacular is still sometimes Nubian, although Arabic is making inroads at its expense. A few rare families still know a few words of Coptic, a language which stems from ancient Egyptian. It was in Nubia that sorghum growing was commenced some 11,000 years ago, 10 centuries before barley in the Middle East. And then came millet, wheat, cotton, and introduced much later by the Arabs, sugarcane, indigo, saffron. But who taught the weaver bird to build its elaborate nest? It is instinct, we are told. Agreed. But for there to be a beginning, there had to be a grain of intelligence. As for the Nubian house, it is built of mud and palm trunks. The mud is unfired, an ideal material at these latitudes. It provides very good protection against the heat in the summer, the cold in the winter, and one only has to bend down to pick it up. The inner courtyards are very spacious. There are numerous rooms, and the decoration draws inspiration from the past. In these parts, the crocodile has long since been on the wane. they again turn to the earth, genuine pottery jars. We are familiar with the ancient history of Egypt, 
the site's gone through with a fine tooth comb by the archaeologists. By contrast, the history of the northern Sudan began to fire the imagination only when the great Aswan Dam threatened to swallow up its temples. Most Sudanese monuments remain to be explored. Dongola, the capital of a Christian realm from the 6th to 14th century, was a wealthy town with walled fortifications, broad streets, and fine churches. In Faras, another Christian capital, 120 frescoes were discovered, some from the 8th century. Heretical light-skinned figures of Byzantine or Coptic tradition. Many an archaeological site is located but a few miles from the Nile, in formerly fertile regions. Nubia, land of mighty contrasts, a wonderfully fertile strip of green, a rend in this immensity of formidable deserts. On the west bank of the Nile, the Libyan desert. On the east bank, the so-called Arabian desert. From Egypt, the Sudan received its gods and its priests, Lying at rest in the sand, there often sleep pharaonic symbols, like the couchant granite rams, little sphinxes of Amun-Re, the sun god. At the foot of the sacred mountain stands the small pyramid of the kingdom of Napata and the Meroe, referred to in the Bible as the land of Cush, a reminder of the kings who gained control of Nubia first of all, and then Egypt. The Egyptian pharaohs of the 25th dynasty were black and came from the Sudan. In Meroe, archaeologists have taken stock of the blocks of stone from 200 pyramids. Egypt has only 80. The temple's bas reliefs depict the lives of the kings who ruled over the area from the sixth to the third cataract, influencing the Nile region right down to the Mediterranean for over 1,000 years. A pedemic, the lion god with the snake's body a Sudanese god worshipped along with the Egyptian divinities. It was long thought that Kush was a mythical realm, yet in Karma were found the ruins of an unfired brick citadel, bearing witness to the true existence of Kush. In ancient times, one-third of the Egyptian population had its roots in deepest Africa. There were many influences from Asia as well. In the fourth century AD, Meroe was gradually swallowed up by the sand. Meroe saw the first great black civilization. Even now, very little is known about it, although it existed 1,200 years. This bronze statue, coated in gold leaf representing a king of Meroe, leaves many a riddle unsolved even for the god Toth, the god with a baboon's head master of knowledge. We are well acquainted with Egyptian hieroglyphics, thanks to translations by Jean-Francois Champollion. Meroitic writing, however, has still not given up its secrets. Neither Egyptologists nor computers have succeeded in deciphering it and even less in decoding any meaning. The term Nubia comes from the word Nub, gold in ancient Egyptian. For 6,000 years, Sudanese Nubia was Egypt's gold reserve. With the caravans, through trade or military expeditions, the Sudan was linked to the land of the pharaohs by the 40-day route, an awesome route 
hardly any oasis or water holes. Provisions for the 1,100 mile journey had to be carried from the start. A few places of rest, however, have existed for centuries, as this archaic well and the grooves on the wood show. Wells up to 200 feet deep on the edge of the desert. The modern version of the caravan and the truck follows the same routes for hundreds of miles. These sand tracks are among the worst in Africa, especially when the Kamsin is blowing. Kamsin, 50 in Arabic, a wind of the Sahara which blows for 50 days in the summer. The caravanserais are the same as ever, even though the straw huts are not. The same tea ceremony, still served very strong in Nubia, and claimed to be thirst quenching when it is heavily sugared and burning hot. <laughs> Beside the desert trail, the young camels give up their coats to the shearer. <laughs> It is from this soft hair that the light materials, the most sought after in the Near East, are woven. These materials are sold throughout the richest oil countries, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Emirates. Near the last affluent of the Nile, the Atbara, where the aristocracy of Eastern Sahel dromedary breeders are to be found, the Beja, or Kababish nomads. The dromedaries are also much in demand in the oil-rich countries. Every year, the Bedouins of Arabia import thousands of camels from Sudanese Nubia. Atbara, a region of formidable traders and breeders. Here it is often said when a friend shakes your hand, don't forget, count your fingers afterwards. Prayer, rest, coins. Money, rest, prayer. Caravanserais several centuries old, which have never been researched in depth. Except by the ox peckers, fond of dromedary ticks. Khartoum, the capital of the Sudan, is an Arabic name meaning elephant trunk. The town owes its name to the elongated shape of the peninsula on which it was built at the confluence of the Blue Nile and the White Nile. It is a city which has modernized in the last century by the British and laid out on the model of the British flag, the Union Jack. It was a brilliant idea, combining humor and strategy. From the middle of the flag's crosses, that is to say from the center of town, the English could keep an eye on all the main streets in all directions without having to move. But anyone coming back from the Sudan can talk about the iron-fisted regime which prevails throughout the country today. Khartoum's Islamic government, known in the past 
for its spirit of tolerance, has imposed upon all regions the Quranic law as established in the Sharia. As in Arabia, criminals are henceforth chastised in public. Alcoholic beverages and gambling have been prohibited. Police checks have mushroomed. Mystics and zealots of God have been rising up on all sides. A century ago, in 1885, Khartoum was stormed by Muslim fanatics. The British governor, General Gordon, was massacred by warriors under al-Mahdi, the head and instigator of the rebellion. For simple folk, al-Mahdi was God's special envoy, the new prophet who had come down to earth to restore fundamental Islamic practices, throw out foreigners, crush the infidels. This extreme nationalistic movement once again has its partisans, particularly in the ranks of the Ansar sect and among the new Muslim brothers. The founder of the Order of the Dervishes in Konya, Turkey, also found followers here. This 13th century Persian poet exclaimed, several paths lead to God. I have chosen dancing and music. Thus shall the world be at my feet, and wildly shall I dance. Further north, downstream of Khartoum, Lake Nasser swallows up the Nile and devours the north of Nubia. At the top of a cliff rebuilt 200 feet up, the grandiose Abu Simbel Temple. Ramesses II, the megalomaniac king, sought to be the equal of the gods. More than any other pharaoh, he had statues in his own image erected, as well as colossal temples to his own glory and that of Nefertari, his queen. Ramesses, the warrior king, the very name of the conqueror, inspired fear. Abu Simbel, the gate of Nubia, opening on to 6,000 years of history, Egypt. Egypt.